Gold here, and I'm going to be going over the kind of surprisingly large 10-game main slate that we have here on uh, Wednesday, June 7. Um, Wednesday is typically a you know getaway day number one in baseball, um, and we kind of get split slates a lot of the time. Really only got a, what, one early game, um, a three-game little turbo, and then a, a big Big 10 game main, so um, nice that we can get a, a full slate here uh, on a Wednesday. So we've got a, a ton of arms in the in the upper range today um, that we can really spread out with. Uh, there's not any any one arm. I mean, if you want to consider Corbin Burns here just sort of leading the way, yeah, he's projecting so far here in very early runs. Um uh, you know, what, three points higher than, than pretty much everybody else. Two and a half, three, give or take. Ownership is following. Um, but I think there's, I mean, and he's obviously the, the most expensive, right? Um, but all of these other arms are very well serviceable. And we're getting a couple of these guys at, at some playable price tags um, down here and some okay matchups. I think some attackable spots, um that we can consider spreading out with here on the mound. That looks like it's going to be kind of the the chalk type of construction tonight. Really not a lot of guys that we're super comfortable with paying for down here. Um, a lot of red numbers, and these guys are all basically projecting in the exact same range themselves, right? Anywhere from 7 to 10 points, 8 to 10 points even. Um, so... What that really tells me on my, my first sort of look is we can, you know, without any real outsized exposure or ownership, rather, coming to any of these guys in the upper mid-range, I think it's pretty easy still to kind of stay off the board a little bit and, and take some shots. Uh, we got some guys in some bad matchups here, of course, some difficult matchups, definitely. Um, so that's what's keeping their ownership depressed. But... What I think we can do is try and capitalize on um, really how spread out a lot of this is. We don't have to necessarily just go and eat Corbin Burns here tonight. Uh, I think it's a fine play. We'll get into that when we get to the games. But um, we can really spread out up here, and that'll make it a little bit easier for us to get different into batter's box because there's two real obvious spots here tonight that uh, I think we're going to want to get to. So that said... Uh, let's just get into the games and try and keep this as condensed as possible, even though I say that every day and it never happens. So let's get into it. Lance Lynn and the Yankees um, in uh, in New York here in the second game of their series. 8,700 for Lynn on the mound. Now, he got bludgeoned in his last start. Uh, I think we could consider Lance Lynn for a bounce here. Um, we saw what Giolito did to them, did to the Yankees last night, missing Aaron Judge, and he's on the DL now with a sprained toe or a busted toe or whatever it is. Um, so they're not fully healthy, and and, and I think there's still a, a good few strikeouts uh, to be had in the Yankee lineup over here. Of course, going after Stanton and and Josh Donaldson. Uh, you've got young hitters. They, they've moved Anthony Volpe back up into the middle of the lineup without Judge here. Um, and they're still piecing things together down at the bottom with an IKF, even though you know, IKF doesn't have a lot of upside himself. Um, and they're they're using Jake Bowers and Willie Calhoun and uh, and things like this. So still overall a, a pretty weak lineup for the Yankees. And given how bad Lance Lynn was in his last start, um, he gave up, what, three dingers and a couple to Otani, one to Trout, gave up another eight runs. So this this was kind of like early season Lance Lynn that sort of resurfaced a little bit after three good starts and really five of his last five of his previous six um, that had been very quality. You know, he'd been going deeper into games, the strikeout stuff resurfaced, and the suppression had really kind of dropped off a little bit. Um, you know, he's still... The strikeout stuff has been there for Lynn pretty much, you know, most of the season. Not so much against lefties. He's still having big, big pro problems with them here. That's because of the lack of a good change and no real out pitch. Um, but the strikeout stuff overall, 
against right-handed heavy lineups has has really kind of been there. Now, the Yankees are probably going to throw, I would say, six righties at him again tonight. So I think this makes him playable at 8,700, and he's only a 20% ownership right now. He's a, a fine value so far. Middling projection, we'd, we'd like this to be a little bit higher. Um, you know, crack the 16 mark, <clears throat> excuse me, for somebody in the upper 8Ks. But I think this is fine, given the other options that we have on the mound today. So uh, if you want to take some pieces against Lance Lynn, it would mostly just be the lefties. Uh, he's got too much swing and miss against the righties, and he suppresses power to them really well. Even though he gives up a little bit of hard contact, he's got a high ground ball rate here with a uh, buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. Stays off of a line, and mostly it's going to be the left-handers. It's big fly balls to the lefties, and this is still Yankee Stadium. So... Um, now Anthony Rizzo, he was very well priced yesterday at a 4,000 flat. He got a price bump to 4,900. Not sure we want to be buying into something like that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so from the left side, I think I'd prefer a Jake Bowers or a Willie Calhoun if I were going to get there. So it's probably, you know, that, that price bump on Anthony Rizzo is going to take me off a little bit. I don't really want to be playing any of the righties, uh, even though you can always kind of play Stanton. Um, and Donaldson at a at cheap price tags. Stanton's at 4,700. That's playable for him. 3,200 for Donaldson. It's playable as well. Glaber has been great really all season. You could play him against righties or lefties, but once again, a difficult matchup here for the right-handers against Lynn. So uh, would mostly prefer to get to Lance Lynn here, but um, would not be surprised if a couple of these lefties, Willie Calhoun, Jake Bowers, and even a Rizzo, kind of get into him a little bit here. These numbers against left-handers are really not dropping. And we've got a full 12 starts on the guy uh, here, what, a month and a half or two months, nearly two and a half months even into the season. So uh, I think he's very much in play. He's similar to Giolito last night, kind of lukewarm on it. but um, And it's going to depend a little bit on how right-handed heavy the Yankees come out tonight. Like I said, they'll likely have six righties in there, so I think he's very much playable. Uh, Randy Vasquez going for the Yanks. They're going to call him up. Don't think they've officially announced him just yet, but uh, by all accounts, around the the, the beat writer um, sort of chain, or that is going to be Vasquez getting his second start. Now, he was fine in his in his first start uh walk some guys right had a little bit of trouble spraying it um and it did, like he's four thousand I, th I think this puts him in play tonight simply due to the price tag and he's seeing a little bit of love so far now if we need to get all the way down here i'm not quite sure um but he would be pretty valuable because at, at four thousand he really only needs 18 points to to really be serviceable in tournaments and and that can at least put you in a decent spot here. And once again, it's it's low ownership. It'll allow you to get to uh, some, you know, very clearly some very expensive stacks like the the Dodgers, uh, who we'll get to, or San Francisco, who is not so expensive necessarily, but will be very popular. So this reduced ownership here on Vasquez will um, will allow you to maneuver your your lineup constructions a little bit more um showed mostly just four pitches in that in that first start but once again he was spraying it a little bit so not my favorite fundamentally to be going after the White Sox here I think you could consider if Vasquez's ownership steams a little bit some White Sox pieces on the other side even though this offense is absolutely dreadful 81 WRC plus 22 and a half percent you know just an average K rate below average power below average hard contact and well below average ground ball to fly ball ratio in terms of, you know, DFS upside averages. And a 289 Woba. So we're not really excited about playing the White Sox necessarily, but this is still a minor league arm, and he's just making a spot start for them. So, um, you know, with Nestor having gone down with the shoulder now, they're going to, once again, need to piece things together in the rotation. So um, is he playable yet? Yes, I, I, I think certainly, because he's 4000 mostly. And this is a decent projection, of course, at 2.5x the salary, um, nearly 3 point per dollar for somebody down at 4000 And that puts him squarely in play because, uh, really, the White Sox are not all that impressive. Um, but if you want to get to, like, this is the healthy White Sox, and, and their lineup is still a big league lineup. Um, so we can absolutely 
get to some White Sox pieces as well. They're very playable price tags, and they're going to be well down the list in terms of ownership today. So um, I think that's very playable. Uh, getting to some Tim Anderson. Uh, Luis Robert is the only expensive one, 5400 He's kind of up there, but Aloy is 43 He's seen a price bump, but 43 is still very playable for a, a pretty damn good hitter when he's healthy. Yoan Moncada at 3700 I think this is a pretty playable price for him as well. Andrew Benintendi, also a lefty at Yankee Stadium, is, is perfectly playable at 3400 So, um, you know, guys like a Gavin Sheets, Andrew Vaughn, good bit of pop as well. So you can mix in some White Sox, I think. Uh, they're down the list for me in in terms of raw value, but um, so I'd probably just side with Vasquez, mostly just due to the price tag. But uh, I think the, the White Sox are certainly playable and definitely in some correlated stacks with some Lance Lynn as well. I think that's a fine play. Okay, Arizona and Washington. I think we can get to offense here in this game again. Um, Zach Davies on the mound, 6,200. I don't think he's cheap enough, number one, and I don't like really anything that goes on. I haven't played Zach Davies, I, I mean, maybe once or twice a season for the last, like, four years. Um, I've been pretty bearish on him for quite some time, and it's because he's given up hard contact really to both sides of the plate. Now, that hasn't really shown out so far this season because he's only got four starts, and he's been hurt. Um, the hard contact numbers really showing out that is but uh, the walks are are a problem for him he's having trouble controlling all of the junk that he's throwing he's got five full pitches here he's historically mainlined a two-seamer with a very susceptible change up so uh, he doesn't throw all that hard and he's very attackable because he pitches to a lot of contact full 83 percent here and if he's gonna have problems walking people he hasn't really gotten on the barrel so much, but the the walks and the very high contact rate with super underwhelming stuff. He's only throwing 90 miles an hour here, um, and he's throwing a lot of kind of junk. Now, this is a pretty weak lineup, of course, overall, but this is a plus matchup for them contact-wise, and I think you could consider getting to some Washington pieces tonight. They're still very cheap outside of... You know, their prices have come up a little bit. Lane Thomas is 4400 but he's the most, most expensive guy in the lineup. Uh, Luis Garcia at 4000 I think, is a very strong play here tonight. We've actually seen their run total pop up about uh, a half a run here in the early runs this morning. Um, Jamer from the left side, I think that's a fine play at 4000 Flat, Corey Dickerson, still very cheap at 2500 Dom Smith popping in value score really as he has for most of the season because he's still 2,000 flat, but you can only play him at first base, so that kind of stinks. Um, so I think the the top half of the lineup here is very much playable. You can get to some kind of contrarian Washington stacks here. Uh, I think this is an upside spot for them going after some Zach Davies. No interest for me in playing Zach Davies and going after a very high contact team. He's just going to pitch to way too much contact himself. On the mound for the Nationals is Corbin here. Now, he's been far, far better this season. We've talked about this in every single one of his, one of his starts. He's been very durable, and he's really getting the slider going again. Um, this is pretty consistent value for him, even though there's not a lot of swing and miss on the pitch. Unfortunately for Corbin, he's still mainlining this, this two-seamer, and he throws it a lot to the right side of the plate, and it's really not very good. He doesn't throw very hard. He doesn't bury this pitch as much as he needs to um, to generate high, high ground ball rate and keep them off of the barrel, the right-handers, that is. Now, he does have the buck 60 ground ball to fly ball, and, and he's keeping them down in the strike zone a little bit, but he's still floating the two-seamer on occasion because he's not throwing it all that hard. He needs to really bury it and, and really get it down in order to generate uh, some swing and miss with this pitch to opposite-handed hitters. And that's why this pitch is very dangerous to throw unless you've got a lot of velocity and really hard sink on it, and Corbin really has neither. He is mixing in the four-seamer a little bit more, but he doesn't have a lot of confidence in, in the four-seamer itself. Uh, he does throw it to some righties, and it, had he not been throwing this pitch at a full uh, 10% in aggregate, he throws it a bit more to the right side he'd be giving up way more power and production than he already is. 306 average is a big number to the right side. And we got 55 and two-thirds on him this season. So they're stacking, the opponents that is, they're stacking right-handers against him uh, because he just can't get him out. He doesn't have a good changeup either. Um, the, the velo delta is fine, but if 
the sinker and the four seamer are bad, as we mentioned ad nauseum this season, the changeup is also likely to be bad. So uh, three, full 306 average. He, he doesn't walk people, so this is all really contact. 359 Wobe and a 188 ISO to the right side. Now, this is sub 200, which means it's not the worst number in baseball anymore. And over the last couple of seasons, Corbin, of course, was very attackable with every right-hander that you could that you could find. Uh, he's still giving up pop, and and when it it gets in the air, um, it's getting hit pretty hard here. He's at a full 9% barrel rate. That's not a terrible number, uh, but it's still very much tackable with north of 30% hard contact. And it's a two-seamer. It's not like this is a 9% barrel rate or um, you know 33% hard contact on, on just a four-seamer or anything. When this sinker is bad, it will float, and it's, it's pretty hard to generate any, um, certainly not no swing and miss, but it's pretty hard to generate any effective um, sort of uh, production counters, if you will. Uh, with this pitch when it is not super elite, and it, it really has never been elite. So, really, he's just a one-pitch guy, and that will suppress a lot of production from the left-handers, uh, which is very strong. We see a higher ground ball rate, lower line drive rate. Soft contact is, is really leaving it on the table because he's not throwing all that hard, right? Um, but he's throwing strikes, and he's not walking people, so that's making him a bit more difficult to stack against this season. That said... I'm going to go right back to Arizona and get to them again. He's a below average arm with below average strikeout stuff. And Arizona really capitalizes and excels in those types of matchups. Saw what they did to a Jake Irvin yesterday. Um, There were about, I mean, the the Diamondbacks are, the the Nationals, I should say, are are quite lucky that the D-backs didn't put up the 20 runs last night. There were a lot of walks and, um, you know, that, that could have been a lot worse for them. Now, there's not going to be as many walks here tonight, but there's going to be a good bit more contact. Pitching to a full 80-81% is Corbin himself. So I like getting to the B, the D-backs once again, and they're still at very playable price tags. Cattel Marte is really the only expensive bat at 4900 You do have Corbin Carroll, of course, at 55 as well. Um, he'll be down in the probably six hole, but I think he's still playable in stacks. I wouldn't be one-offing a Corbin Carroll tonight, but you're going to get him at lower ownership. And if he gets on base, he's going to steal second and he's going to steal third as well with the lefty on the mound. So um, still plenty of upside for Carroll getting on base here tonight. I want to try and get to some of the D-backs once again, but um, if I had to choose, I think in tournaments, Washington is a bit more of an intriguing stack for me because they're going to come in at lower ownership. And I think Zach Davies is, is very much tackable on the mound. Okay, let's move on. Houston and Toronto. Uh, we saw what um, Kevin Gosman did to the Astros last night and, and what he did to me and everybody else that played a good bit of Mitch Keller. Um, I'm not sure that Chris Bassett is going to have the same type of success tonight. I'd like to get to a good bit of the Astros. We'll get to Bassett in a second. Uh, Ronel Blanco on the mound for Houston. He's making his second spot start um, with the 24 injuries that they've got in the starting rotation as well. Now he's 5,200 also in play because of the price tag, but this is a horrible matchup. So I'm not going to be going after any Ronel Blanco. Um, if I'm getting down here, there's one other guy that I think we might be able to consider um, outside of the, the Randy Vasquez that we already talked about with the Yankees. So I'm going to be leaving Blanco on the shelf here. And I'd like to probably try and get to some Toronto um, now he does have a slider and he kind of, you know, main lines the slider. This is his main pitch, but he's got walk problems. He has trouble throwing it anywhere near the strike zone. And, you know, that's generally good when we are targeting Toronto. We like guys with, um, good chase in them and, and a slider that they can start or breaking arsenal that they can start as a strike and have it dive out of the strike zone. And that's not quite Blanco, at least what he's displayed um, here in most of his appearances this season. It's just a bullpen arm, so this could be a a full-on uh, bullpen game for Houston. However, in his last start, he did go five and a third. So he's most likely stretched out enough to last that long, if he could last that long. Uh, however, he's been giving up a lot of power in a very short sample here to the right side of the plate. 
and we mentioned the walk problem. So there, there's fly ball problems, and line drive problems, and power problems, and average problems, and, and this is not a good recipe, uh, even though we might have a, a pretty decent pitch here. So been on the barrel at a full 9.5 and, and pushing 10% uh, with walks and, and hard contact issues. Um, I think that's a, a very attackable spot for Toronto tonight. They will kind of be down the list a little bit. Um, in in ownership runs here, and, and certainly in value, they're still very expensive, but uh, I think that's going to keep their ownership down, and I think that makes them a very playable and attackable spot. So uh, I like Toronto uh, a pretty decent bit here in tournaments tonight. We'll see if Vladdy can get off the schneid here a little bit. He's at 5,300 still, um, so I think that's a, a very playable first base piece tonight. Bo has been great really all season, 5,400 for him. Springer has awoken a little bit. Uh, he's at 53 now. So you've got to pay for these top three guys. Matt Chapman, still not super cheap, 4,700, but he's a very high fly ball hitter. And we'd like to get to guys that can get the baseball in the air, certainly in Toronto. So um, some cheaper pieces, maybe Dalton Varsho. He had a bomb last night, maybe waking up a little bit. I think that's playable. Allie Kirk getting more regular at bats now that Danny Jansen is on the shelf. Uh, he, they've been working on his swing, trying to get him to hit the baseball in the air a little bit more as well. And if this ground ball to fly ball type of lean here with a four seamer slider, um, sort of mixture from Blanco is to persist, then some of these line drive and ground ball hitters like Vladdy, like Bichette, like Springer, and certainly an Alejandro Kirk as well, that makes them very much playable, and it, and it lines up to be a pretty damn good batted ball profile matchup for them. So uh, I like getting to some kind of off-the-board Toronto here. Um, it's just price tag that you're going to have to manage with them, but with some cheaper arms on the mound, I think that's going to be uh, very much workable. Chris Bassett for them, not one of the cheaper arms on the mound. I think he is in play, um, but I really do not like this price tag. I'm probably going to try and, and get to as much Houston as I can. Um, I want to go after Bassett again, and I, I really don't like all the junk that he's throwing, and he's really only getting value out of the two-seamer here. Um, now, that's a fine pitch against same-handed hitters, right? But we've talked about this with Bassett in his starts. It, it's a really very vulnerable pitch to opposite-handed hitters, and he's still getting picked apart by left-handers. 254 average, not so much there, but a 380 Woba buoyed a little bit by an 11% walk rate to the left side, but a full 279 ISO. That is a monster figure, and that puts Jordan Alvarez and Kyle Tucker squarely in play tonight. I think Kyle Tucker at 5,100 is probably one of the best outfield price-adjusted plays on the slate tonight, because... Chris Bassett here with just a, a sub-22% strikeout rate is giving up a lot of fly balls to them and a lot of power. So um, that doesn't mean that Jordan is a, a bad play necessarily, but uh, 5,900 is a little stiffer to get to. And, I mean, he's a better hitter than Kyle Tucker. Uh, let's not kid ourselves there. But I think price adjusted, uh, that Kyle Tucker is really what kind of jumps off the page at me here. So uh, I think he's a very strong play. Um, but like I said, it... Houston is still going to go pretty right-handed heavy here. And production-wise, Chris Bassett still suppresses a lot of production to right-handers. So there's going to be six, at least six, uh, right-handers in, in the lineup for Houston tonight. And we saw, once again, what Gosman did to them. Now, he doesn't have near the chase, near the swing and miss that, that Gosman does, does Chris Bassett. So that's why I'd like to... Uh, this will be a uh, far more regular contact matchup because... Bassett pitches to a 79, nearly 80% contact rate. Um, so that puts me on to some of the lefties because of the lack of swing and miss against them and, and the, the fastball that he, he really um, he uses pretty much exclusively. I mean, he mixes in this cutter, but with a break-even slider, cutter is likely to be break-even as well. He's not throwing all that hard. So um, I think it's very attackable with with the lefties, certainly, but that puts me on to a little bit of the righties that don't strike out either, and that's Alex Bregman. And we'll see if Jose Altuve is back last night or back um, tonight. He was out last night, I meant to say, um, and really the only damage against Gosman was the Moe Bone leadoff dinger, which was uh, kind of ridiculous. Um, so I'd like to get to 
a very playable Jose Altuve at 4,600 if I can make that happen. Uh, I'm not super scared of Chris Bassett with right-handers and very good right-handers, like a like an Altuve or a Bregman that doesn't really strike out a lot. Um, we are kind of worried about some soft contact that he'll induce to them. So that's why I do think he is in play. But uh, what's really taking me off mostly here is the price tag. I, I don't think um, a lot of the... the the upside is is really there at this particular price. I like him at 8,500. I think that'd be a, a far more interesting play um, to consider here tonight. So still looking for a little bit of regression in the suppression here. 3.41 ERA with expected metrics. About a run higher here. A very low whip. Um, so I think given the susceptibility to the left-handers and the fact that he's having a little bit of trouble keeping them off base for free. Uh, I, I think Houston is an intriguing tournament stack as well here tonight. A little down the list for me, and certainly farther than Toronto. I'd much rather just play Toronto at roughly the same ownership. But uh, I think both sides offensively are here in play, and probably very little, if any, pitching for me in that game. Um, same thing here in Cincinnati. Once again, we're going to try and get to as much of the Dodgers as we can against Brandon Williamson. However, I think this is a far less attackable spot tonight than it was... Uh, last night against Luke Weaver, Brandon Williamson's been very good in his first four starts. Now, he's given a pop to the right side of the plate, but he's got five full pitches here that he's using. He's getting picked apart a little bit so far with the four-seamer and four-seamer command. Uh, he's spraying a little bit really to the right side as well and hasn't been able to generate a lot of swing and miss against them so far. Um but he is throwing the cutter, and, and a, he's got a good slider that will get him some ground balls and some swing and miss against the left side. So not to say that really takes me off of a Freddie Freeman or a Max Muncie um, necessarily, but um, it may be a little bit of uh, hidden upside for Brandon Williamson against those two bats in particular. Um, now, Max Muncie is lefties, you know, just fine. He's a little bit weaker. I mean... We'd obviously prefer him against righties, but uh, not like he's bad against lefties necessarily. Um, so he's still very playable, and he's only 4,600 tonight, so I, I think it's a pretty playable price tag for him. Freddie Freeman, of course, you can play him against everybody, righty or lefty, uh, in baseball, does not matter at all. Um, so we have no problems really getting to full stacks of the Dodgers once again. Uh, it's price tag and ownership that we're going to have to balance once, once more, and... With Brandon Williamson, at least compared to Luke Weaver, uh, I think he's a little bit more serviceable. He's got more in the tank that he can work with, and he could be a little bit more balanced than it, in the arsenal, that is, than can Luke Weaver. So um, that doesn't mean I want to play him. I'm certainly not going to be playing him. Uh, I think he's overpriced for this particular matchup. If he were, oh, I don't know, 6,200, I think you could maybe consider taking some shots here. But this is an incredibly dangerous matchup um, against the Dodgers. 11.5% aggregate walk rate, just 600 PAs, but a 117 WRC plus, 242 ISO. That's a monster figure for a team aggregate with 36% hard contact. I mean, this is the Dodgers. They're going to walk. They don't really even strike out against left-handed pitching, and they hit for a lot of power, a lot of hard contact with baseballs in the air. And this is a tiny ballpark, and it's warm in Cincinnati tonight. So, um, you know, despite the fact that I think Bra uh, Brandon Williamson could be a little bit more serviceable than Weaver in terms of raw suppression, uh, we're still not going near him, and we're still going to stack the Dodgers as much as we can when we can. Uh, Noah Syndergaard's on the mound for them. 6,600. I'm going to stack the Reds, too. I'm going to go right back to them, and they kind of got there in the later innings last night, but um, I think there's going to be insane value on them once again. They finally called up uh, Ellie De La Cruz. He is a super, super high upside player. Uh, shortstop prospect for them right should remind us a lot of uh, like an O'Neill Cruz for Pittsburgh he's just a huge huge body and he's got an insanely high upside hit tool he's a switch hitter though and um, you know O'Neill Cruz has some pretty severe problems against left-handers and some pretty big strikeout problems now Ellie De La Cruz he's going to strike out a good bit as well but Norris Syndergaard is not going to throw it past him so um, despite a $700 price bump on Ellie He's very likely to be in the four hole again tonight. And unfortunately, he hasn't gotten dual eligibility just yet. That will come in the next week. So you have to choose when we're stacking the Reds between um, playing Ellie or Matt McClain. 
Um, now the the price gap shrinking a little bit does put McLean a little bit more in play tonight than it you know, compared to last night, for example, when in, he was 4,500 and Ellie was the the stone min at 2,000. Um, so I think there's you know stacks of the Reds that you could consider or that you very well should consider playing some Matt McLean as well. Um, now. No Syndergaard, he's going to give it up to both sides, giving it up a lot of average. 296 to the lefties, but a full 310 to the righties. So Ellie's going to hit from the left side tonight, but Matt McClain from the right side is a very high upside contact hitter as well uh, with pop and with speed. So uh, I think both of those guys are in play, and certainly Jake Fraley, again, they'll likely lead him off once more. Um, they may very well put Ellie up at the top. I mean, who knows what they're going to do, but... Pretty much everybody in the top half of the lineup here, including the right-hander, Spencer Steer, I like this, at 4200 uh, Johnny India at 54 I think is a playable price tag for him tonight as well. And I'd even try and get to some Tyler Stevenson at 3800 I like him sub-4,000. If you need to get cheaper with some of the guys down at the bottom, like a Kevin Newman, Will Benson, or a Fairchild, or, or whatever they end up doing down at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, th these are all playable pieces in stacks as well because Syndergaard, he's been really getting picked apart this entire season. Six and a half ERA. Now his expected metrics uh, a bit lower. XFIP two runs lower. So likely to see a little bit of regression in terms of the suppression for Syndergaard coming. But um, even at 6,600, I'm not thrilled with this price tag because I don't think there's any any floor for him. He's got a 15% raw K rate. And as we mentioned yesterday, the Reds here are a very sticky team against right-handed pitching. Even though they don't create a lot, it's not, uh, it's not as bad as the White Sox or, um, or Cleveland, for example. Uh, you know, they are at an 88 WRC plus it's well below average. Don't get me wrong, but it's still not uh, totally horrendous in, in the sixties and the seventies range. So, with a 10% walk rate that does make them a little bit sticky, and they've got some guys now, certainly with Ellie, um, he's get one of the fastest guys in all of baseball, even though he's only had uh, you know, one start. Now that he's in the big leagues, uh, this kid has insane speed, power from both sides of the plate, hits the baseball exceptionally hard, um, and as do really all of the, uh, the, the other five guys at the top of the lineup, Fraley, McLean, India, Spencer Steer as well. So this it makes them a little difficult to go after. So I don't think tonight would necessarily be the time when we see this regression start to set in for Syndergaard. Now he is 6,600, and they don't create in aggregate, right? We do have a 1,700 PA sample on the Reds against righties, and they are just at an 88 WRC+. plus. But... Syndergaard doing the same thing, mainlining this sinker for the most part, using a lot of the cutter and the four-seamer, though, but there's no value. He's a one-pitch guy, and it's really not all that valuable Valuable a pitch, as we've talked about. So um, he's given it up to righties, he's given it up to lefties, and I want to get to as much of this game as possible. Cincinnati is popping in as, as a top-five value stack for us here so far today. But not so much in ownership. I think you can get right back to the Reds and play every single one of them. I am I really like getting to Cincinnati tonight, going after Syndergaard. Okay, let's move on. Boston and Cleveland. Cutter Crawford on the mound. Don't think we could play him. Um, he's been getting picked apart by left-handers to a pretty high clip really all season. They had to move him to the bullpen. Um, and most of his appearances have, have come out of the pen. They did just bring him in. He may have been hurt recently as well and dealing with all kinds of shenanigans there. Um, they may have just removed him from the rotation because he was getting bludgeoned early in the early part of the season, giving up way too much power. Not so much in the way of average, but a 274 Woba, that's actually a pretty damn good number as well. It's because he doesn't really walk people. It's the 257 ISO that's really taken him apart with a 33% hard contact. So he gave up a lot of fly balls and those fly balls were really going over the wall. So uh, we could probably expect a little bit of regression in that department um, with a very high homer to fly ball rate of 13.5%. That's about league average for an offense. Now for a an equitable starting pitcher, not so much. We want this far, far lower. So um, now the average exit velo numbers are pretty good. Sub 87 miles an hour, that's a damn good number. As I said, doesn't walk people. He throws strikes, and he has some whiff stuff with a, a pretty decent 
uh, splitter against the left uh, against the left side. But the, the issue is he will kind of pipe and um, really get on the barrel a little bit with the four seamer. This cutter doesn't really move as much as it really needs to to induce uh, all of the ground balls that would keep lefties from you know really taking him apart. Um, he does induce 26% soft contact, so that's a, a good number and sort of an omen of what could be to come with the splitter and the cutter combination in terms of suppressing a lot of this power and regression, the positive regression for Crawford against the left side. Um, that said, this is Cleveland, and they're still going to platoon. They're still gonna, not going to strike out. So I think you consider getting to some Cleveland pieces – uh, they're just outside the top five in, in value so far, mostly because they're cheap. It's not because you know, they're a, a good offense or anything necessarily, but um, you know, very strong values pretty much across the board. The only guy you got to pay for is Jose Ramirez. I really don't want to pay 5000 for him, even though I know the upside is there for him somewhere. He is really struggling this year. Um, you know, The power and the RBI numbers are way, way down to his career averages getting into the summer here a little bit so hopefully we can see Josie heat up but um you know not my favorite third base play at at 5,000 flat that said if you're stacking any Cleveland and going after some of this uh susceptibility for Cutter Cutter Crawford really mostly against the left side uh, you're definitely not leaving leaving Josie off your stacks um They've got both of their first basemen healthy again with Josh Bell and Josh Naylor, so you got to choose between them, but they're super cheap and only a $700 price delta between them, so not um, not too difficult to make that really work if you need to. Stephen Kwan, sub-4,000 now. And I think this is a, a very playable price tag for him now. Still a high-contact hitter and actually hit a ball over the wall like two, three days ago or something like that. So a um, little bit of pop. And, and hidden value, I think there's a little bit of upside that we could maybe tap into at a 3,800 price tag. Uh, Andres Jimenez down to 3,600. This is far, far more playable down when he's down in the six hole. Will Brennan still very cheap at 2,300. A little bit of pop there as well. So this is a playable and very cheap stack if you need to get up to, say, a Corbin Burns and another expensive arm, like a, one that we will get to in the next game. So, um I think Cleveland as a stack is very playable. It's pretty rare that we're that I'm going to say that, but I think they're attackable here going after some Cutter Crawford um, on the mound. It's pretty unlikely that he's fully stretched out. His last appearance was, I believe, three or four days ago or something, if I remember correctly. Um, and he did go three, just three innings. So it's likely to be kind of a, a piecemeal bullpen game for Boston here tonight. That generally takes me off of the opposing offense, and certainly when it would it would take me off because it's Cleveland. But given that we might get a little bit more depth out of Cutter Crawford here tonight, I think it, that puts the Guardians in play. Tanner Bybee, I kind of like this. This is one of the arms in the mid-range. I think this is okay. Um, now, I usually do not like going after Boston um, with a right-hander, certainly with a young right-hander, but I really like Tanner Bybee. He has a... Very high upside um, strikeout tool for a super young arm. And his control has been excellent in his first seven starts. Um, we saw in his first start when he came up, he struck out like, what, 10 or 11 Rockies or, or whatever it was. Um, and he's been very serviceable. He's gotten picked apart in a couple. He's He struck out eight Rockies. Uh, he's been picked apart in, his, in a couple of his outings, right? Uh, Detroit. Took him apart a little bit. The Mets kind of did as well. And in his last outing against Minnesota, they kind of got to him also. But it hasn't he hasn't been totally blown apart. Um, most he's given up is four earned. Um, and that was in that really abbreviated outing against Detroit. So I think there's a, maybe a little bit of, of hidden upside. I'm, I'm not super crazy about this price tag. Don't get me wrong. I'd like him if he were at 7,500. Um, but I think the, the projection and, and value score here put him in play. And the Arsenal, with a good four-seamer, a good slider, and a really good changeup, that, that's going to allow him to really work around a lot of the very strong left-handed hitters over here from Boston. Now, they're not going to strike out a lot, and uh, that really kind of 
uh, makes me balk a little bit, but I think this is a, a fine tournament play if you want to mix in a little bit of Bybee to your pools. I think a full 15% is is probably okay. Um, if you come in slightly under this or even slightly over this, I don't, I'm not sure I would um, I would complain too much. He's got elite control, and he stays off of the barrel. The problem is he's a high, heavy, heavy fly ball pitcher so far. Um, it's not hard contact that we're necessarily worried about, so that's why I kind of like getting to... Uh, a little bit of Bybee here tonight. Um, but, you know, get, let's not get it confused. Boston is still a very, very strong team against right-handed pitching, and they're going to be able to get the ball on the line here a little bit with a buck 20 ground ball to fly ball. It's a fine batted ball uh, profile matchup for them. Uh, they still make a lot of hard contact, still hit for power, but this is a bigger ballpark and kind of a downgrade a little bit going into progressive from Fenway. So uh, I think Bybee is in play. Uh, I probably won't go out of my way to, you know, click him in uh, with all that much enthusiasm in like single entry type of stuff. But uh, I think he is in play in some correlated stacks uh, with Cleveland if you end up getting there. Uh, you can al also always play Boston, um, you know, against pretty much every righty in baseball. But I think that's a very playable spot for Cleveland Pretty much across the board, and including in the betting markets, laying, dollar, laying just a dollar forty tonight. Uh, okay, let's move on. Mets and the Braves. Scherzer on the mound, ninety-seven hundred. Uh, okay, now now we're talking. Um, Scherzer is it seems to be rounding into form a little bit here, and his last two starts. Uh, now one, granted, it was Colorado, but it was at Coors Field, so can't really ignore that. He went a full six innings, gave up just the one run, and sprayed what six hits and struck out eight. That was very, very encouraging to see for Scherzer. He was 8,700 in his last start against Philly, also went seven innings and struck out nine, gave up, again, just one run. So I think Scherzer is kind of rounding into form here a little bit. Another very difficult matchup for him uh, against a super high-powered offense. But I'm okay getting to Scherzer here at sub-20% ownership again. I think it's a playable price tag for him. The projection seems fine, a little low naturally for Scherzer, but, of course, this is... Um, mostly due to his opponent on the other side in the Braves. So I think it's very playable for Scherzer. Um, he's still giving up a little bit of pop. It, a short sample here because he got thrown out, he's been hurt or whatever. We do have nine starts, and everything seems to be rounding back into form a little bit for Scherzer. Still a high strand rate. Um, so if we're going to see a little bit of regression, he does have a 440 XFIP with a you know low 3 ZRA. So a little bit could be coming there. Um, he's on the barrel still a little bit, and Scherzer has always had a homer problem. So um, that kind of, I mean, it, you got to balk a little bit when you go into Atlanta to take on the Braves and, with a fly ball pitcher who's, you know, got homer problems. Um, I mean, it's not horrible homer problems. It's not like he's giving up two and a half a game or, or something like that, but he's a stone lock to give up at least one dinger pretty much every outing. So uh, very much attackable. Historically, it's been with lefties. I don't think that's really going to change. So I, th I think the the delta that we have here in the numbers, at least the power numbers um, for righties versus lefties, that's going to swap as the sample fleshes out a little bit more. And he will very likely be more attackable with left-handers. Uh, he's given up north of 30% hard contact pretty much most of his career against left-handers. So I think that's, um, if, we, if we want to get to some Braves, a couple of these lefties here, Matt Olson, I don't really want to pay 5700 for him, uh, though, against Scherzer. So I'm not super jacked about that. But I think Eddie is still fine and playable. Michael Harris is still fine and playable. You can always play Acuna. It doesn't really matter. Um, even against right, he's going to strike out a lot, though. So I think Scherzer is very much in play, uh, as it are the Braves. Now, if, if Scherzer, I mean, you're getting a full... 20% uh, ownership on him. You can get some leverage by playing some Brave stacks as well. Sean Murphy down to 4,200. I think this is a playable price tag for him. Riley, and as I mentioned, Matt Olson, they're expensive 48 and 57 in this particular matchup. Acuna at 62. Still, yeah. Um, so it's not my favorite to be getting to the Braves, but they're not nearly as far down the list as you would think otherwise. I think, I, I think Scherzer is rounding into form. Um, but this is still, you know, as I mentioned about nine times by now, he, he's got, he's a fly ball pitcher with Homer problems in a 
pretty hitter-friendly ballpark uh, when the weather is warm. Now, we'll probably have to keep an eye on pop-up storms, etc. We're kind of in that season with Atlanta, um, and they were delayed again last night. So they may be pulling all kinds of weather shenanigans down there. So we have to keep an eye on that, especially if we're playing pitchers, less so when we're playing an offense. Um, but I think uh, both sides are really here in play with Scherzer. Charlie Wharton, I think he's in play too. 9,200, I like this price tag. And uh, even though, like, I'm still going to take shots against him, right? I've been shorting Charlie for a while now because eventually this curveball, he, he, he's not going to have it in one of these starts. And he's going to get absolutely blown apart because every other one of the pitches is never any good. Four-seamer's never good. The two-seamer's never good. Change is never good. Slider's never good that he very rarely throws anyway. So when this curveball is eventually bad, it, like the pitch is not going to be good every single outing, even though it is a very good pitch. Um, he, he's not going to have anything to work with. He's totally relegated to being a one-pitch guy at the moment, and... He doesn't really have any good fastball command, giving up a lot of value to the field there. So I'm still looking to get on the other side and and stack teams against Charlie Morton. I think the Mets are a viable candidate once again. Um, their price tag's still dropping here, so I think we could go... Unfortunately, with, uh, with the Mets, they're going to platoon heavy. I wish they'd just look at some freaking numbers here and see that... You know, and just, like, stack every righty they could. Um, but... You know, they're they're not going to do that. Frankie's going to hit from the left side. Nimmo, of course, going to hit from the left side, as will McNeil. But they're still going to have their Brett Beatty, Danny Vogelbach types of plays in there. Now, they'll be a little bit more balanced. So I think, um, you know, compared to his last several outings, Charlie's, uh, he's faced some pretty lefty-heavy lineups. Now, they will platoon those few guys, right? But uh, I still think they're going to probably go with a... a maybe five lefties with four righties in the list. Um, and that makes them playable. Hopefully it won't even be a, a Danny Vogelbach tonight. Hopefully it'll be, um, you know, like somebody else from the right side. So we'll see what they want to do. Uh, I prefer that they just throw out nine righties because he gives up hard contact and he's got a lower strikeout rate and far lower whiff stuff to them. He does suppress contact or suppress production a little bit more to them, um, and that's with the curveball. But um, yeah, he's got a 29% push and 30% strikeout rate to the left side. So uh, in terms of raw contact, I'd much prefer there be righties there. Um, but he's in play at 9,200 because Mets are still a very low upside offense in general, um, and he is only pitching to a 72% contact rate overall. It's a very, very good number still for Charlie Morton. So um, looking for some regression for Charlie, but I, I think this price tag puts him in play, and, and the matchup still puts him in play. So I think pretty much everybody is in play in this game. Scherzer, the Braves, Charlie, and the Mets as well. Okay, let's move on. Baltimore and Milwaukee. Dean Kramer on the mound, 7,800. Oof, you got a price bump here uh, from 67, and I'm not really thrilled about it, to be quite honest. Um, now, I, I do think he's okay, and he's in play if you land on this, because it's super low ownership. He has upside for 20 and 25. Um, it's just not all that regular for Dean. He isn't really all that impressive in terms of the arsenal, right? He's only got the one good pitch that's, that's providing him any sort of value so far, break even on the four-seamer, you know, which is really all you can ask for with a guy that's only got a 20% K rate. He doesn't walk a lot of people, just a 7% walk rate. It's very strong. He throws strike one at a full 64% clip. Very attractive there. It's the barrel rate and the hard contact numbers that really take me off Dean Kramer. So I think we could get to some Brewer stacks here. Uh, I don't like the price bump on him. And despite very low ownership, if you land on a couple of these teams and it, if you need to get different with like a Dodgers and San Francisco stack or something like that, then sure, I think it, it's reasonable because Milwaukee is a pretty below average offense against right-handed pitching. However, like I, I mentioned, Dean Kramer's given up a lot of hard contact, 42% to the lefties and 35% to the righties. He's given up a lot of production, 183 ISO, 147 ISO to the lefties and righties respectively. With a with some fly balls here, right? So 28% um, line drive rate against left-handers is super worrisome. That is an exceptionally elevated figure. And with hard contact, um, 
I mean, he doesn't have an out pitch, really. He, he cannot get lefties out. So I want to get to some of Milwaukee here. Um. Yelich, I think, is very much playable, 4,600. You can play Rowdy. I like this at 4,400 as well. Now, Bryce Terang, he's been really, really struggling. Hopefully, he got off the schneid a little bit last night with a triple. He was like two for his last 41 or 42 or something like that. Really, really struggling down there at the bottom of the lineup, but a playable left-handed piece there for sure. That doesn't mean that because they're only going to have three lefties or so in the lineup with Luis Urias back, that you can't play any of the righties because he's still giving up fly balls at a neutral ground ball to fly ball, 20% line drive rate, and 35% hard contact to the righties too. So I think it's very, I prefer the lefties here, but you can get to full stacks absolutely uh, against Dean Kramer. I think the Brewers here are in an upside spot and I'd like to get to some of them where I can. Now they're way down the list in, in both value and ownership right now. So that is, might make it a little bit hard for us to get there. Um, but I think this is a, a spot where the Brewers have some very sneaky upside. And if you want to play some correlated stacks with Corbin Burns to get very different, well, the offense is not going to be played really at all. So if you want to play the Brewers with Corbin Burns, I think it's a viable construction for sure. And that allows you to instantly differentiate from the rest of the 35% of the field that's going to be on him. So um, he is leading the way in projection and value and, and of course, in price tag, too. Um, my only concern here is that this is Baltimore and this is a hard lineup to go after. Now, Freddie was fine last night, right? And Baltimore is missing Cedric Mullins, who they have replaced at the top of the lineup with like Adam Frazier, right? So not nearly the same type of upside there for Frazier. Um, and it, it is a significant downgrade for Baltimore missing Cedric at the top. However, they still have Rutch, they still have Santander, they still have Austin Hayes, who's an okay piece against right-handed pitching in particular. Uh, Gunner seemed to be coming into his own a little bit more. He's at a very cheap and playable 3400 Ryan Mountcastle at 4500 I think this is a playable price tag for him. Kind of a down matchup generally, but is it really? 248 average allowed to righties for Corbin Burns here. 328 Woba, those two are, are pretty damn good numbers. It's a 190 ISO and 36% hard contact that really kind of jump off the page at us. He's got a, he's an 060 ground ball to fly ball against the right side in a full 12 starts this year. This is not a short sample, and these are pretty concerning numbers. He's got a 23% line drive rate against the righties as well with a 2.1 homers per nine. That maybe is a little bit noisy, but he's having trouble keeping lefties off base because he's got a 12% walk rate there, even though he's got higher whiff stuff and suppresses contact with a really good cutter against the left side. He's putting some of them on base for free, and then he's giving up very hard contact and a good bit of power at a 190 ISO to the righties. So uh, I think that puts Baltimore as leverage stacks in play because Corbin Burns is going to be very, very popular. And at 35% or north of that in many tournaments tonight I think that puts Baltimore leverage stacks in play as well um probably just short stacks but you can certainly play Rutsch you can play Santander you can play Gunner or Adam Frazier they're cheap enough to make this happen or good enough hitters in the case of Adley Rutschman who is you know still 5400 um but I like Ryan Mountcastle I like Austin Hayes I I mean do we really want to be chasing the Aaron Hicks resurgence at 2500 uh, probably not but um you know, like a, a Georgie Mateo, he's back down to 4,000 at the bottom of the lineup. Makes makes it a playable stack uh, if you need to mix in some of those pieces. So um, I like Corbin Burns, for sure, going after a depleted Orioles lineup. But uh, he is absolutely susceptible, so I would not be surprised if he gets picked apart here a little bit at very high ownership. I think he would not be my preference up at the top uh, on the mound tonight. Um, even though I do like some correlated brewer stacks and et cetera, et cetera, he'd probably not be my preference. And I'd like to maybe get to some of the other guys to get off of this. Uh, some of the other guys I don't think are nearly as susceptible, um, in particular, like a Tanner Bybee, for example, uh, even though he's got a, on paper, worse matchup and he's, you know, well, he's far cheaper. So that said, I think pretty much everybody outside of Dean Kramer is in play here. Uh, I like the brewers as a good off the board stack and, that would probably put me on to a little bit more ownership than I would otherwise have with Corbin Burns. Um, 
given that I, I think he's going to get some run support here. And I want to attack Dean Kramer definitely, but I think um, some game stacks, if you want to go after that, if you could make that kind of happen, uh, I think that's a viable construction here. Uh, okay, offense probably only here uh, for me. Maybe some John Gray in the St. Louis and Texas game. I don't want anything to do with Jack Flaherty. I've stacked against him every single start, um, and I'm going to continue to do it. The walk rate is still not coming down, and even though the the values are starting to flatten out a little bit, he's getting more value on the curveball. Slider is still pretty good. Changeup, which he's very rarely using, has been fine for him so far. And the cutter value is starting to increase a little bit. So the suppression to both sides of the plate is really starting to normalize a little bit. But I still have problems with a very high walk rate. And if you're going to put people on base for free, he's doing it to both sides. 14% still to the lefties and 11% to the righties. If you're going to put people on base for free, that makes you attackable. That makes it super difficult for you to be able to work to your plus pitches in the counts that you want to throw them. So I would like to go after Jack Flaherty again, and there's no chance that I, I start somebody with a 12% walk rate against the Rangers. It's just not happening. Um, I, wa I want to go after this, and I want to stack them once again. Even though they are well down the list in value, that's mostly due to their pricing. They're insanely expensive. 6K for Semyon, 59 for Seager, uh, 47 for Nate Lowe. Now he's getting a, a price bump as well. Adelise Garcia is 56, and Josh Young is 52. Uh, Jonah Heim even at 46. I, think, I believe Mitch Garver, he was 43 last night at the top of my head. Um, don't remember his price from when I looked this morning. But all of these guys are very expensive. So that's going to keep them in, in their ownership. They'll be totally ignored, but... Um, with Tampa, this is the most high powered offense in baseball. Um, and it's, it's against righties, it's against lefties, it's against everybody. And certainly it's against guys that have walk problems. So I'm not going to be playing Flaherty, um, at 8,100. Now, if you want to take shorts on, on the price tags of Texas here with Flaherty, he has been better admittedly in his most recent starts. He's starting to figure things out a little bit. Um, you know, for example, in his last two starts, he's walked only uh, one guy each. That was against Cleveland, and a very high contact team, and against Pittsburgh, who is a very bad team. So, um, you know, before that, he was walking four, walking two, walking five, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the problems aren't totally gone for Flaherty, even though the pitch values are starting to, um, you know, creep into the green here. So I think we can get after... Some clarity here. I'm definitely going to want to try and get to some Texas. Uh, this will almost certainly have to be forced in because of their price tags. But uh, I think it's warranted manually exposing yourself to um, to some Texas stacks every single day against every single starting pitcher in baseball. Uh, this lineup is too dangerous. And, and they can make it happen against literally everybody. John Gray on the mound for them at 8,900. Uh, I really don't like this price tag, and it's mostly because um, th where's the strikeout stuff for John? Like, the slider and the change of value is great, but where's the swing and miss? I mean, it's totally gone, and his, I mean, this is down, what, three and four ticks from where he was just last season when he kind of had a, a real career resurgence. Um, he's just not throwing it past anybody. He's throwing to a lot more contact, even though it's only 76%. It's far more than he, than he used to throw to. Now, having a little bit of trouble spotting the four-seamer and establishing with, with this pitch, and it's still just a six- to eight-mile-an-hour velo delta. Um, the changeup is to the four-seamer. We like to see that a little bit higher, but it's it's been a very valuable weapon for him this season, as is the slider. It's been very, very good. Three-and-a-half outs above average is an elite pitch. Uh, he's giving a little bit of it back with the curveball, but um, overall, a pretty serviceable three-pitch arsenal. I think that puts him in play. I really don't like the price tag, and I really don't like the matchup, right? I don't like um, going after St. Louis. Even though they've cooled down quite a bit here, uh, they're still a very dangerous and very potent offense against righties and lefties. They still make a lot of hard contact, 36% in aggregate. Now, it's not necessarily going to be a huge problem against John Gray. He only gives up 26% to the right side, 31% to the left side. Those are really good numbers. He throws a lot of strikes. He's not walking a lot of people. It's just the lack of swing and miss that takes me off at 8,900. I do think he's in play because they're... 11 guys in this range that we could play. Um, 
and he's at reduced ownership. If you want to play some correlated Texas stacks, I think that's all right. I'm probably not going to end up landing on a lot of this. Um, this projection sub 15 points and an elevated price tag with just a 25 value score here, it, it makes it pretty difficult for me to get too thrilled about it. Uh, I still think, you know, having watched a lot of him in Colorado, waiting for a really good breakout from John Gray, I still don't really trust the guy. So, um, you know, maybe that's a little bias seeping in, but uh, I don't know. The numbers are kind of backing me up here a little bit. Um, I think we're looking for some regression for John. He's got an 87% strand rate. That's a monster figure, not sustainable at all. Two and a half ERA with expected metrics, a full two runs higher in 11 starts this season. So uh, I think there's uh, some regression that uh, opposing offenses are yet to uncover for John Gray to the downside. And what better offense than the St. Louis Cardinals to do it to him? So uh, I'm probably going to end up staying off of this offense almost exclusively here for me in Texas tonight. Okay, San Francisco and Colorado. Um, now, I think we can play some Logan Webb. Like, he's 9,900. He's got pretty damn good whiff stuff, right? 24, 29% to the right side, 24% to the lefties. He doesn't give up power. He stays on the ground. Very high ground ball to fly ball ratio to both sides of the plate. Main line's a sinker, but as we talked about earlier, you need to bury this pitch to induce the ground balls, unlike the Patrick Corbin. It's basically the same velocity, but Logan Webb gets it much farther down in the strike zone. He throws a ton of strikes, 70% strike one. He's got a just elite chase with this changeup. The slider leaves it on the table a little bit, but he focuses mostly on these two pitches, the sinker change. The slider, it he could get a little bit more swing and miss um, against the, the right side of the plate or the lefties if he buried this a little bit more back foot. Um, so I would like to see a few more swinging strikes out of him, but look at this called strike rate north of 21%. That is elite. So I don't see anything wrong here fundamentally for Logan Webb. I don't want to go after him. I love the ground ball to fly ball ratio combined with the high whiff stuff. That makes him very much playable at Coors Field, a sinker slider change arsenal can play very well at altitude. So um, I want to go after that. He's got a very high strand rate. This number is sustainable at 78% for a guy with this high ground ball stuff. So um, I I think Logan Webb is very much in play here. He's only at 17%. It's going to keep his ownership down because he's playing at Coors Field. And he's also 9,900, so he's not cheap. But I think this is a fine pivot if you get off of some Corbin Burns uh, at 10-2, I think it's a fine play. Uh, I have really no gripes with this. It's still a course field, don't get me wrong, but it's a pretty underwhelming offense overall, even though they are kind of sticky. They're not going to strike out nearly as much as they have in past seasons. 88 WRC plus, though, they're not going to create a whole hell of a lot. No power. They're not going to hit the baseball over the wall, even though they will get it on the line with a little bit of hard contact. They don't walk a lot. It's basically average. They're neutral ground ball to fly ball. It's the line drives that are mostly attackable here. But Logan Webb, he didn't give up any line drives. Everything is on the ground here at a two and a half to one ground ball to fly ball. So uh, very much playable and in play at uh, 9,900 and just 17% ownership here for Logan Webb. Uh, we're also not going to be playing Connor Siebel. We're going to be playing a, a good bit of the Giants here. Now, the Rockies bullpen... They threw a ton of pitches. They Denelson Lamette didn't last all that long last night, and a couple of their relievers really struggled as well and threw a lot of pitches. Um, their pitching staff last night averaged, I believe, north of 26 pitches per inning. That, that's a huge, huge, huge number. Um, so the, the Rockies are really kind of lucky that the Giants didn't put up about 20 last night. They pretty easily could have. Um so that said, I, I don't think Connor Siebel's going to be long for the game here. He's, you know, he's stretched out. He started a few games for him now, but um, really giving a pop to both sides of the plays, giving up a lot of average here. He's unlikely to be be able to last, you know, five innings here. Uh, I would say, you know, it's not walks or or barrels necessarily that are the problem. Um, having a little bit of trouble getting ahead of hitters, and he just doesn't have any swing and miss. So. That's really how we need to go after the Giants, and certainly at Coors Field. So I, I think um, getting to as much San Francisco as we can tonight is perfectly warranted. They will very likely come in more popular than the Dodgers, and that's probably just because of the pricing. Uh, Dodgers are far more difficult to get to. 
if you want to play some expensive arms. Well, the Giants unlock all of that. So, um, you know, there's, what, one guy at 5000 that's Tyro Estrada, and he's really earned that price tag all season. Jock is back at 4100 That's very playable. J.D. Davis, 45 That's fine, too. Uh, you play righties. You play lefties. Uh, Connor Siebel has actually given up more production to the right side so far um, in his abbreviated sort of sample here, just 41 and two-thirds. 41% hard contact to the right side. With a lot of fly balls, neutral ground ball to fly ball to righties and a little heavier in the fly ball category to the lefties. So very much attackable, not playable, even at a super cheap price tag against a volatile offense in San Francisco. But uh, not tonight. So as much Giants as you can really get, um, maybe a Rockies piece here or there, but like they're kind of expensive and I don't particularly want to go after Logan Webb. Okay, Chicago and the Angels, last game of the night here. Chicago was kind of disappointing last night. Um, looked like they were really going to get after Tyler Anderson, but he settled in a little bit, and the bullpen kind of did also. Um, I think we're going to be able to get to some offense here once again tonight. Now, this game will be a little bit more off the board. Angels less so. Cubs maybe. Um, 5,500 on the mound for the Cubs, and Jameson Tyon. Ay, 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 ay. Um, he was serviceable in his last start. The problem with Tyon is he's just not striking out anybody anymore. He's just at just a 21% aggregate K rate this season. Chase is fine at, at 30%. He's throwing a lot of strikes still, um, but that's getting him re- right over the barrel. Perhaps he's turning the corner a little bit. I think the price tag puts him in play, and this is the guy that I alluded to earlier when I said we had one more that we could potentially consider. Um, it is Tyon, and it's just because of a, uh, 5,500 price tag. If we're not, if we don't need to get all the way down to a Randy Vasquez, um, I think Tyon, it, it, he's fine at 5,500. The Angels are very attackable. They're a pretty low upside, or low consistency, I should say, um, consistency up upside uh, offense. Um, but they still have you know all the power in the world. With uh, Otani, Taylor Ward hit a bomb last night. He's 3,200 now. I think this is a damn good play. Uh, Trout is down to 57. Anthony Rondon was back last night. He didn't play a lot because they're worried that he's just going to get hurt again. Uh, but he's 3,300 at third base. I think that's very playable. He'll probably get you know, two and three at-bats uh, once again tonight. Matt Theis behind the plate at 2,500. Uh, I think this makes for a very intriguing angel stack once again, even though they can be frustrating sometimes if Otani and Trout are not hitting the baseball over the wall. Um, but with Ward and and Randone and, and Thice making, you know, their price tags, making Trout and Otani far more attainable, uh, I think you can play pretty much everybody. Hunter, Hunter Renfro down to 3,600 now. Jared Walsh still 2,000. So uh, if you want to play Brandon Drury, yeah, go ahead. So I think this is a very workable stack. They've got a little bit of multi-position eligibility here with Drury and, and you know, Otani, of course. Um, everybody else, you, you got to kind of lock in. I think that's fine going after Tyon. He's not been great really all season, so I'm not going to go out of my way to play any of him. But if I land on a couple of Tyon teams, I wouldn't necessarily exit out. He does have 20 and and 22 points in the tank or something, and that's fine at 5,500. Um, he's a fine value for somebody down in this price range. We obviously want you know, north of 25 if we could get it for somebody down here this cheap. But at 5,500, he unlocks pretty much everything, and nobody's going to be playing him. So if you need to get very contrarian, if you're stacking the Dodgers and and stacking uh, San Francisco with him, you could play a tie-on. Uh, that said, he's been so dreadful, really, without a lot of whiff stuff all season, mostly to the left side, uh, you can stack the Angels, and you're not going to get any arguments from me. Uh, Jaime Berea on the mound for... Los Angeles, 7,000. I think he's playable as well, and he's probably the one guy I would consider getting to down in this kind of 7K range um, with any, like, relatively decent exposure, 10% or more. And I I think he's in play at 7,000. He's got a a pretty decent four-seamer slider mix. Most of his appearances have come out of the bullpen, so we got to be aware of that. Um, And we got to wait for these numbers to kind of flesh out a little bit, but uh, very good suppression numbers here. Average exit velo, sub 85 miles an hour is an incredible figure. Hasn't walked anybody, and he's staying off the barrel at an excellent clip, just 2% barrel rate. So I think this puts him in play against the Cubs, who have been really struggling 
recently. They've been pretty damn cold. Um, I think the Cubs are in play as well because there's some variance with Berea. And some of these lefties are are cheap enough to, to work into pretty much any team. And say Suzuki and Nico Horner are some pretty damn good hitters. Ian Happ, for example, is... 3,700. I think that's very playable. Mike Talkman in the middle of the list at 25. Matt Mervis, he'll be at first base by most accounts. He's at 2,100. They've been pulling the, the Miles Mastroboni shenanigans up at the uh, top of the lineup. He's second and third eligibility at 2,200. So if you want to get to some very cheap Cub stacks here and stack the Dodgers with a Burns and a, a I don't know, a Logan Webb or something, um, they're one of the shorter stacks that could make this happen. So I, th- I think pretty much everybody is in play here. I'd probably side with uh, Jaime Perea, then the Angels, uh, yeah, yeah, then probably a ways. You know, maybe then the Cubs, then Tyon, but I think it's pretty close uh, between, you know, the Cubs and Tyon in terms of, you know, who would like to play. So I think every everything is in play here. Interesting tournament game, and um, really there's only a two-game late slate with the Coors game tonight, so not all that interesting there, but uh, very playable for sure. Uh, okay, that's it for the breakdown. Once again, keep an eye out for projections, uploads, and ownership pushes. We will have those throughout the day. Keep an eye on if, if some of these ownership steam here, like a Lance Lantern, for example, um, I think you can play some Yankees on the other side. Uh, a couple of lefties, maybe. If uh, if Corbin Burns steams north of 40% or something, uh, he will certainly in some contests. Um, I think playing some Baltimore leverage stacks on the other side, very viable. So I think we can get different with some guys up here on the mound. You don't have to eat a ton of ownership. Um, you're going to want to get to the Dodgers and want to get to San Francisco, of course. But some Yankees pieces against the Lance Lynn, or even some White Sox against Randy Vasquez, a young arm over here, those are playable. I like Arizona. And and Washington, once again, no pitching here for me. I, I, I do like getting to some Washington. They're another cheap stack that can make a lot of the more uh, popular builds really work for you. Uh, Ronel Blanco, no thank you. Um, and Chris Bassett, probably no thank you as well. I'd like to get to some hidden offense here in Toronto tonight with, uh, with Houston. I, I do like going after Chris Bassett a little bit. He is in play if you land on it. It's not the worst, um, but really not thrilled with that price tag at 9500 uh, Dodgers and Cincinnati, offense only here for me. Um, I, I just don't think we could play Syndergaard. He's got to show me that he could throw it past somebody. And I don't think the Reds are going to be able, uh, or he's going to do that against the Reds tonight. So um, I really like getting to the Reds, and there's still very high upside uh, switch hitter in what's likely to be the four hole again tonight with Ellie De Cruz. Good red stack. I like this a lot. Um, Cleveland, I think you could probably consider some stacks with them. But given all of the other offenses, I'm kind of off of them a little bit more than I was maybe earlier in the vid here. Um, But Tanner Bybee, I do like going after Boston here tonight. I think that's a a decent tournament play. He has upside to pick through this lineup uh, with a very good arsenal. Um, Cutter Crawford, no thank you. Uh, But if you land on, you know, somebody super cheap targeting Cleveland, I mean... Can I really argue with you? That offense is dreadful. Uh, Mets in Atlanta. Scherzer for sure. Morton, yeah, definitely. Um, I think he's playable at 92 in this particular matchup. But offenses as well. I think there's susceptibility for both of these guys. I'm waiting for Charlie to get blown apart. And Scherzer still as a fly ball pitcher in a small ballpark against a very good offense. Baltimore and Milwaukee, I think everybody is in play here too, outside of Dean Kramer. So uh, talked about the leverage stacks against Corbin Burns. If you want to make that happen, that's fine. I think Milwaukee is a very, very intriguing off-the-board tournament stack uh, in deep stuff. Now, you can maybe get to a couple of these guys in tournaments here. Dean Kramer's got some regression coming. He's going to get blasted soon. St. Louis and Texas, um, really probably no pitching here for me. I don't like the price tag on John Gray. I think he's in play, um, maybe a little bit more so than a Chris Bassett, for example. But I like offense almost exclusively. No Flaherty for me. I'm just going to continue stacking against the guy. And, you know, he's going to continue making me look like a moron. Um, like Texas, so if we can make it happen, you're going to have to force this in. They're majorly expensive. San Francisco, Colorado. San Francisco pretty much exclusively here tonight. I don't want to go after Logan Webb. And I really do want to go after Connor Seabold. So give me a lot of San Francisco if I can make it happen. And Angels and the Cubs... Um, you know, we talked about a little bit of tie-on, maybe if you land on it. Jaime Berea, I think he's probably the one guy I would like to get to in that in that low 7K range. Uh, I think that's fine. Correlated stacks with some Angels. Yeah, okay. You can go after tie-on. And you can play some short stacks 
uh, of the Cubs as well. They're cheap enough to make that happen. So uh, that's it for the breakdown, guys. Keep an eye out for uh, projections pushes, and good luck to everybody on this 10-game Wednesday.